Hey, well, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the Ngunnawal people as the traditional owners of the land on which we are meeting this evening and recognize their unique contribution to our environmental and cultural heritage, past, present, and future. Um, and I'd like to recognize all indigenous people and their elders in attendance here today. Uh, I'd also like to uh, recognize um, a delegation from Nepal um, that have been spending uh, the week uh, at the Institute for Governance, um, drawing lessons um, between uh, Nepalese federalism and Australian federalism. Nepal has just embarked on probably one of the most ambitious um, federal um, agendas I've ever seen. So essentially, they're going for a very thin layer of central government and they're devolving everything to local government. Um, so good luck with that. Um, Obviously, they've been drawing lessons from um, problems within, within federalism in Australia in terms of how we can affect um, a more cooperative federalism. But anyway, welcome. Welcome to you. Um, and welcome, everybody, to this um, smart governance conversation on finding fiscal space lessons for the development of new policy proposals. Um, to help me with this topic, I'm absolutely delighted to have um, the support of, of Jane Halton, um, AO and Public Service Medalist. As you're all aware, Jane was the longest serving secretary in the Australian Public Service, um, and the second, the longest serving secretary, and the second woman appointed as a secretary. She was also the first woman appointed as secretary of a central agency. Uh, Jane was um, secretary of the Department of Health between January 2002 and June 2014, and she also led the Department of Finance from 2014 to 2016. She was awarded the um, AFI Westpac 100 Women of Influence Award in 2014, the Public Health Assurance of Australia 2015 President's Award, and she received an Order of Australia in 2015 as well. Jane is currently sitting on a variety of advisory committees and boards, and in fact, she joined the, the board of ANZ Bank in October 2016. We're also privileged as well to have her as an adjunct professor in the Institute um, for Governance. Um, now, one of the reasons why I've invited Jane to be with us today is not just because she's got a, a forensic understanding of, of policy and public finance here in Australia, um, but because she was actually the sponsor um, of a course that we co-designed with central agencies um, on public policy and finance for the Australian public sector. Um, and the purpose of today's um, smart governance conversation is really to draw lessons from that program. Um, and um, it's been wonderful to see how successful that program's been. Um, first under Jane's sponsorship, and then latterly um, with the support of, of Rosemary um, Huxable. Um, so essentially the way we're going to do this session is I'm going to talk for 25 minutes um, about the key lessons that we can draw from that program. And then I'm going to hand over to Jane, because obviously Jane particularly has obviously a much more um, insightful set of observations um, around the, the fiscal sustainability um, dimensions um, of what we're going to be talking about um, in this session. Okay, so um, in terms of this particular program, uh, the program was a co-design program. Um, we set up a, a reference group um, with um, the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet, Treasury, um, and also the Department of Education as a, as a line agency. Uh, we also had um, a representation from the Australian Public Service Commission. And we sought to co-design a program um, with five key aims. Uh, the fundamental aim was to enhance the quality of new policy proposals um, going into to Cabinet and the Expenditure Review Committee uh, to provide an improved understanding of the government's fiscal strategy and how that shapes the nature of new policy proposals in Australia. Uh, to build business planning capability, uh, to encourage new ways of doing policy and services, um, and fundamentally as well to build collaborative relationships between central and line agencies. 
So in other words, so we could build a program in which line agencies could see like a central agency and central agencies could see like a line agency. So of course, in terms of understanding new, new policy proposals, um, we contextualize the development of those pro proposals within the context of the Australian budgetary process. Um, I should say it's also great to see um, a large number of participants from the program um, here today as well. So you'll obviously be able to contribute to the, to the discussion um, around some of the lessons that we can draw from, from the program. Um, I should also say the great thing about this program is that we were able to bring together the best of theory and the best of practice. We had some of Australia's most insightful um, practitioners standing alongside um, some great international and domestic authorities on different areas of public policy and finance. So actually bringing together theory and practice in a meaningful way was at the heart of this program. Obviously, we focus particularly on the way in which new policy proposals go through a process of, of formulation. Um, and of course, we focus particularly on the way in which new policy proposals emerge from prime minister or cabinet decisions, portfolio ministers' priorities, such as um, those um, um, articulated through charter letters, responses to reviews and reports, for example, uh, the intergenerational, last intergenerational report has stimulated the opportunity for a number of new policy proposals around how we deal um, with our aging population and how we support um, elderly Australians to, to be able to live a full and rewarding retirement. Um, and also there's a whole range of new policy proposals that emerge through election commitments. So in this part of proceedings, I'm going to focus first of all on the importance of policy context. Uh, one of the things that was absolutely clear in terms of the contributions of practitioners is that context is everything. Um, and I'm gonna focus there on particularly three dilemmas. Uh, the problem of trust, right? um, the problem of how we get evidence into policy making, right? in a highly politicized environment, um, and then finally as well, um, how do we deal with a situation when we have a, a prime minister uh, that has provided a clarion call to the Australian public service to innovate, but at the same time there's still a big focus on the fiscal strategy and on fiscal consolidation. Does that provide barriers or does that provide opportunities? I'll actually be arguing from a more optimistic perspective and say that that actually is providing opportunities and there are a number of compelling examples of that. Then I'm going to look at the question about, well, um, given these constraints, what does, book, what does good practice look like in the development of new policy proposals? Then, you know, does the Westminster advisory system have adaptive capacity? And finally, what are the conditions necessary for better policy making? Now, I should also say that um, on all the data that I present here today, you can find the reports um, or details of the books from which the data comes on the Institute for Governance website. And you should all, of course, have a copy as well um, of the PowerPoint presentation. Okay, so the policy context. We are governing in times of mistrust. Um, last year... Um, IGPA and the Museum of Australian Democracy commissioned Ipsos to survey 1,500 Australians on the relationship between trust in the political system and attitudes to, towards democracy. We then spent the whole year conducting focus groups right around Australia um, with what we term different slices of Australian life um, to get a, a more detailed perception of their attitudes towards democracy, government and politicians. Um, now, the, 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 obviously, the key message here is that this is a period of quite um, significant distrust in government and politicians, but particularly of the political class. And, of course, that impacts on the Australian public service because um, citizens don't distinguish between public servants um, and politicians. They conflate everything as, as government. Although, interesting enough, we did ask them a question on their perceptions of public servants, 
um, and they were much more positive about public servants because they have a positive relationship of the, uh, a, a positive relationship through their service providers. Um, so actually, when we when we 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 can actually say quite strongly that there is very very deep distrust of Australia's politicians, but actually there's quite a significant degree of trust in public servants, and we have to rem remember that. So. We call this survey the Power of Us survey, and for those people who are interested, the data is going to inform the design of a new exhibition to be launched here in Old Parliament House in March 2017. So obviously we look forward to seeing you at that exhibition. Now, um, the findings make very difficult reading for Australians' political parties, but they provide strong clues, clues as to how the public service can improve the relationship between government and the citizen, because the public service has a key role to, to play there. Um, you're probably aware that satisfaction with democracy in Australia is now at its lowest level since 1996, and we've seen an extremely steep decline since the end of the Howard period up until um, the present period. Um, no more than 4.6% of Australians have strong trust in their government and their politicians. Um, and remarkably, this increases with age. Um, elderly Australians are now more distrustful of their government than Indigenous Australians in Australia. Now, that is remarkable, given that we've had 25 years of economic growth. Um, and that cohort of Australians have, have benefited so significantly... Um, from the post-war settlement and from um, economic success. Party loyalty is now at its lowest level since 1967, uh, which explains the rise in the popularity of independence. But remarkably, interest in politics is very strong. So what we're seeing here is that it's not that people aren't interested in politics, and it's not that people don't support the values of democracy, they just don't like the nature of contemporary politics as it's played out up there on the hill. We trust governments to address national security issues, but little else. Trust drives limited confidence in the ability of government to perform core tasks. So this regression analysis shows you, basically, that there isn't any core responsibility of Commonwealth government where citizens believe have trust in their ability to deal with the problem, apart from in relation to the defense and security area. And trust in federal government all also um, um, is obviously... I mean, the reason why this is important, of course, is that if we have low citizens' trust in the ability of comfort and confidence in government to perform key tasks, then they have less confid confidence in markets, right? And then that can, can impact on broader... Um, confidence in, in market volition in, in, in general. Um, but interesting enough, trust is not yet driving political participation. So in Europe, we're seeing a massive swing away from what is called allegiant governance towards assertive governance. At the moment, Australian citizens are what I call divergent, right? So in other words, people are going on the streets in the way that they are in Europe, Okay? They're focusing much more on their um, antipathy for government and politicians. So it's not leading to um, political mobilization around things like direct action. Okay, so all of this, despite 25 years of economic growth, creates a big challenge for the public service. Interestingly enough, at the same time, in a national survey that we did earlier on this year um, with Telstra, um, there is also compelling evidence to demonstrate that Australians want the public service to innovate. They want the, the Australian public service to embrace dig digitization, and they want the public service to take risks. They want to have the same relationship with government that they have with their iPhone or their iPad, and they understand that Apple take risks to develop a better product. Um, so there's some really strong data, and that was really quite a, a rigorous national survey, um, of permission for the public service to, to innovate. So critical dilemma two, of course, is if we're going to see like a citizen, if we're going to connect better with a citizen, this requires new ways of doing policy, or actually, to be, honestly, to be honest, 
the combination of traditional and new ways of doing policy. So, for example, co-design, and Jenny and I were talking about this earlier, is based upon very um, uh, traditional principles of participatory um, governance, essentially, and empathy. There's nothing new about it. There may be a, a new technological layer that goes over it, but a lot of this is about combining traditional tools of empathy with opportunities afforded by new technology. So the third dilemma is that we have a policy advisory system that's under pressure. Um, over the last two or three years, and you can see the findings of this in, in, in our latest book on evidence-based policy making in the social sciences, methods that matter, um, we held a series of, of, of workshops in New Zealand, Australia and the United Kingdom, um, and we asked senior policy advisors about what they do and why. Um, and um, we held a series of workshops, and we also did a, a, a survey, um, and these are the key findings. First of all, um, most senior policy advisors are of the view that evidence is a condition of better policy making, but then they say that actually evidence-based policy making is a hobby rather than a mainstream activity in terms of policy advice, um, and actually they only spend a small proportion of their time on on evidence-based policy making. They spend most of their time retrofitting evidence to decisions that have already been taken, or what Meredith Edwards has called policy-based um, evidence. And there's a large percentage who believe that there is an ongoing tension between short-term imperative and evidence-based policy making. And a large percentage who agree that there is ministerial indifference over the facts. Okay, when, um, in, and, I have to say we probably had over 300 participants in our workshops across, across those three countries. And we got them to identify what they view to be the major barriers to getting evidence into policy making. Um, the most important in terms of this discussion are the pathology of the short term, um, the constraints of the fiscal environment, the scrutiny from the 24-7 media cycle and the way in which that created a culture of risk aversion at the political level. Uh, the dominant agenda-setting role of political advisors, um, short-term budgets and planning horizons, and a capability deficit in political awareness amongst political ad advisors. Okay, we also have um, some very strong expectations from the Prime Minister um, in terms of the Australian Public Service. Most of you, I'm sure, have come across the speech that he made last year in the Great Hall, where he gave this great clarion call for the APS to be an exemplar and or a catalyst to the new economy. Uh, and obviously that was articulated within the context of, of the whole paradigm around the ideas boom. Um, and actually, to be frank, I think a lot of what he said made absolute sense. Um, so I'm not actually criticizing that clarion call. I think it was an important clarion call and has stimulated a lot of innovation across the Australian Public Service in Canberra. Unfortunately, it's not connected particularly well with the broader Australian citizenry. So he hasn't really got any political capital around what has become a really, really important agenda. But this is also an administration that continues to emphasize fiscal discipline, and this is a key dimension to the development of new policy proposals. So as set out in budget paper number one, the government remains committed to its strategy of returning the budget to surplus by maintaining strong fiscal discipline, strengthening the government's balance sheet, and redirecting government spending to boost productivity and workforce participation. So you either have two competing ontologies there, the ideas boom and innovation, or debt and deficit and fiscal consolidation, um, or you have an opportunity for um, innovation. So given these constraints, what does good practice look like from the development of recent new policy proposals? First of all, in terms of capabilities. Um, now, interestingly enough, we work with a department, so one of the key um, assessments for the program was people had to develop their own new policy proposal. So, of course, we had to think about, well, how are we going to evaluate these new policy proposals? 
Um, so particular capabilities came to the fore, the importance of detailed knowledge of the financial implications of the proposal, um, a firm grasp of key NPP concepts around the fiscal strategy. What does fiscal space mean? How can you be in innovative with ASL, et cetera? Um, the importance of evidence still, the importance of presenting a robust evidence base, the importance of presenting a succinct understanding of the five components of the new policy proposal, and those around what the policy pro problem is and why the Commonwealth should intervene, what the expected outcomes are and why and how the proposal will achieve them, um, a short policy impact statement on regional Australia due to the present um, government's agenda, and of course the fact that the Nationals did very well in the last election, um, the policy justification regarding charging where relevant, and who has been consulted and what sensitivities exist. Um, we also emphasised in the programme the importance of a strong understanding of the tactics and negotiation, negotiations involved in winning the war of ideas, the importance of great writing skills, because ministers don't, well, some ministers do, but a lot of ministers don't like to read a lot, so jargon-free, coherent and well-written narrative, and a firm grasp of key policy tools, cost-benefit, impact assessment, regulation, uh, regulatory impact assessment, co-design, et cetera, depending on the proposal. So from this, um, we can actually identify the emergence of what I would call nine ingredients of effective policy design for the 21st century. The first, I would argue, is the importance of strategic alignment. The ability to see like a minister, to see like her political office, to see like the central agencies, and the importance of building strong relationships, particularly with the central agencies and the ministerial office, up front and early in the process. The importance of using evidence as a weapon. Evidence to win the war of ideas. The importance of designing a performance framework up front that prepares for monitoring and evaluation. Too often, monitoring and evaluation is kicked to implementers, so there becomes a, a disconnect between the policy design and the implementation framework. Quite often, no performance frameworks are developed within new policy proposals. So we have a number of major governmental agendas that have actually been in chain, maybe for at least two or three years, that have only just developed a performance framework. The importance of ensuring line of sight between policy goals, delivery, and outcomes. The importance of being inclusive through consultation with, with stakeholders, through co-design and co-production, depending on the nature of the proposal. The importance of finding fiscal space, and, and Jane's going to talk about that. So, so are there innovative forms of finance available? Um, for example, if, if I was to ask you, which is the most financially sustainable level of government in Australia, I don't think many of you would understand or would know that it was local government, right? Local government has very significant um, um, opportunities for par partnership funding, but is always viewed as the partner of last resort. Why? Local government is always viewed as the partner of first resort in a lot of other Westminster-style democracies. So how do you find fiscal space? The importance of experimentation where possible, of try testing and learning, the importance of thinking long-term, and fundamentally, the importance of upfront integration of communication, narrative, and messaging in policy design. Again, the tradition is you kick the narrative to the communications team. No, it's a fundamental component of policy design from the first announceable that a minister makes. Okay, so does the Westminster policy advisory system have adaptive capacity to respond to these changes um, and challenges? Well, actually, I'm very, very optimistic about this, actually, because I actually do believe that there is some really positive work occurring at the moment in the Australian public service that is meeting this challenge. And I should also say that social science is leading the way in supporting um, new ways of doing policy making. We're seeing fast policy learning projects using new co-design and accelerator innovation methods in the smart cities, national innovation and science 
um, agenda through what are called agile projects. We're seeing user co-design for online service provision through the Digital Transformation Agency and the Department of Human Services. We're seeing social inclusion projects using co-design through the DSS's Try, Test and Learn Fund. At the moment, Canberra is a veritable um, laboratory in the, in the use of new methods and experimentation. Um, four methods that particularly matter, and which we discussed in detail in our book, are around the use of behavioral insights, co-design, deliberative democratic innovation, and digital ena enablers such as big data um, analytics. We've, we're also seeing the way in which government is acting as a digital enabler. Um, and I just provide there in your handouts a number of examples of innovation um, in terms of artificial intelligence, the enhancement of data capability, the introduction of new governance innovations, the new introduction of new ways of investing in digital technology, procurement, online digital service delivery, and even regulation. So there is exciting work occurring, even if it isn't connecting up with the citizenry. Um, artificial intelligence at the moment is a classic example of this. There is significant policy innovation happening in the Department of Human Services using co-design methodology, where Mark Sager from the University of Auckland, who won an Oscar for Avatar, King Kong, and Spider-Man 2, is working on the development of a new Avatar public servant called Nadia for the National Disability and Insurance Agency, which has emotional intelligence um, through co-design work that Mark has done um, with a group of Australians experiencing various forms of disability. For the first time, the Australian Public Service has an emotionally intelligent avatar public servant, and she has tested phenomenally well. On average, right, participants on the National Disability and Insurance Scheme have spent an hour and 10 minutes with Nadia. Now, obviously, big moral implications of this, huge moral implications of this, because of course you can have a million Nadias as long as you've got cloud storage, but what does that mean in terms of call centers? What does that mean in terms of human interaction in public service production? So we are seeing some really interesting findings emerging from this experimentation. We're seeing broader ownership and legitimacy. We're seeing greater balance of expertise in policy making, better citizen user understanding, better overseas understanding, better research evidence. And we're also seeing proof of concept through experiments. So these are exciting times. But of course, they need specific conditions. They need collective trust between the political and permanent elite. It needs collective recognition of the complexity of doing good policy and that you might not get good outcomes for a couple of years. There needs to be an appetite for experimentation. There needs to be an appetite and the ability to collaborate. And there needs to be access to social science skills and expertise in design and experimental methods. And fundamentally, there needs to be high quality communication in all things. Okay, so I'm gonna leave it there um, and hand over to, to, to Jane. It's always a worry when Mark is your warm up act. He's a hard act to follow. Can I start by acknowledging the traditional owners on whose lands we meet and pay my respects to elders past and present? Can I also say that uh, there are some things in life that stay the same, and there are some things in life that change with regularity. And like death and taxes, the budget process grinds on in a sort of relentless and inevitable way. But what goes on beneath the process that grinds on, and everybody knows when it gets to about October or November that somebody somewhere is starting to use a P word, priorities. And everybody knows that if they're in the wrong area in a department, in January, their holiday will be ruined if the P word falls anywhere near them. And everyone he knows that in February and March, if you're in the Department of Finance, you'll be reading crappy policy proposals, 
having conversations that attempt to be respectful for people who should know about the detail of what they've put on a piece of paper, but you can't figure it out. And the person in the department will be thinking that the person from finance is a bloody idiot because they can't understand the perfectly pearly prose that they have put on a piece of paper. You know the process? Many of you know the process. So let me start with an overarching comment that it's important to understand that we sit sometimes in the middle of those processes and feel incredibly frustrated by them. We feel that we aren't heard, we feel that they're stupid, we feel that they are a waste of time. And I do like to remind people that if you look at the Australian Public Service and indeed how the Commonwealth budget is run, uh, we are actually still right up there in terms of leading the world. So notwithstanding the um, head-belting sensation that you get at the wrong time in about March, when you're on your third resubmission of that bloody good idea, you manage to convince somebody should come forward, that it's worth it. So let me go back to the fundamental premise on which our budget process is made. And I will come to fiscal space, but there's a bunch of context I want to get to, and I want to build on some of the things that Marcus said. The fundamental premise on which our budgetary process is made is the notion of contest of ideas. It is not um, a select few who will simply decide what everyone else is going to do and railroad ideas through. It is founded on the notion of contest. Why is that? Particularly when you've just read a green brief and you hate everything that was in it. A contest of ideas should, at least in theory, much like co-design, enable a range of views to be elicited from a group of people who come from different perspectives, have a series of um, components of knowledge or understanding or practical experience, which means that when it comes to the people we entrust to make decisions, that they will make a good decision. Because like every public servant that ever walked the earth, I knew even if I sat at the ERC table and someone actually asked me my opinion, which I would give freely, at the end of the day, I was never the decision maker. The people we elect as citizens, this is a democracy, they will make the decision. And so we would all hope, I think, that the decisions that they make are the best decisions they can make. And they're the most informed decisions. They are founded on the notion of co-design. They are founded on evidence. They are founded on solid, solid facts. Now, we all understand the notion of random acts of violence. It doesn't always happen. But that is the fundamental underpinning of our budget process. So we have a contest of ideas. We also have discipline. Why do we have discipline? In my experience, Discipline is fundamental to actually managing our democracy and our economy. So discipline means that a very enthusiastic, over-energetic Minister of Health cannot simply decide, notwithstanding that it's a jolly good idea, that he or she will spend the entire Commonwealth budget on every vaccine known to man. Inevitably, there are things you can spend money on, doesn't matter if you're the Minister for Health, the Minister for Industry, the Minister for Education, the Minister for whatever, the Minister of Defence spends off scratch, as we all know. So you need discipline in order to make sure that your overarching fiscal objectives, i.e. how are we going to manage our economy, how are they going to be realised, and how is it we are going to actually decide what our priorities are. And I want to come back to evidence-based policy in a minute because I think there's a fundamental misunderstanding about what that means, but bear with me. So we need to decide what the priorities are if we're sitting at the centre of government and there are lots of people who are going to give you gratuitous advice. I used to say that gratuitous advice is my stock in trade, freely given. That's what I do better than anything else. But every politician who comes together to make a set of decisions will be bombarded by everybody from the person who they go buy their baguette from on a Saturday morning when they're back in their electorate 
to the receptionist who's just been harassed by some lunatic on the telephone as they walk into their office, to the person who they see walking down the street. Everyone's got an opinion and they usually give them freely. So as a politician, you've got to decide what you want to do. You've got to decide what's important. You use all manner of um, methods of doing this. You examine entrails of all varieties in order to form a view about what you should do. Then you come together with your colleagues to discuss what we should do, what we want to do, and then what we need to do. So there's some things you need to do. You have no choice. There's been a huge flood somewhere. There's been a disaster of some sort. Our society actually mandates that we will look after people in those circumstances. You are going to need to do that. The notion that, that is discretionary expenditure, no, it's not going to happen. So you have to decide, sitting politically, what you want to do, what you need to do, and then you've got to decide what you can do because of the dollars. So you've got an overarching framework, and you have to say to yourself, do I care about deficit? Do I give a rats? Does it matter? I can just borrow from whomever's prepared to lend us money at whatever price they'll charge us? Or do I think to myself, uh, the price of that money might go up, and every dollar I spend on interest that I've borrowed is a dollar I now can't spend on something I need or I want to do. So you have to decide what your fiscal strategy is. You have to decide whether or not the big borrowing, big interest price that you're going to pay is a priority and you need to do it. And sometimes you do. When we're in a trough economically, you've got a lot of people on unemployment benefit. That's one of our social norms, I think. Uh, it's a bit like uh, we all, everyone signed on to Medicare. So how much money do you have to spend and when you're in better economic times, more than 25 years, I had to tell you, um, are you going to pay down some of that debt? So that's going to help you decide how much money you're going to ask for people to save and how much money you're going to ask people, uh, say, tell people that they can spend in any budget process. So this economic context, it's really important to understand. So if you're actually a person who's got to write a new policy proposal, lucky you, because someone somewhere has decided that they want you to do some work on something that might get a priority. Excellent. Good for you. And all the things that Mark talked about, ensure, ensuring that it's based on good design, that it's got decent evidence in it, all those other things are incredibly important. But somewhere higher up in the, you know, up in the clouds, someone will have decided what our strategy should be. Now, I am an unashamed supporter of fiscal consolidation on the basis that I personally want to be in a position where if there is another global economic shock, and let's be really clear, the reason we have had 26 or 27 years of uh, uninterrupted growth is because when the rest of the world was actually in serious trouble, we could actually spend our way out of it. No one should be in any doubt about that. And you can have an argument about whether we spend on the wrong things or whether we didn't stop it early enough. You know, we could debate all of those things probably from now till eternity. But in truth, uh, we did not take the dip everyone else did because we had that fiscal space. So I'm an unashamed supporter of getting back to a position of surplus. Now, separate conversation about how fast you should actually consolidate. And by consolidate, what we actually mean is what proportion of GDP should government be spending and how fast can you bring that down? So in other words, how big is the deficit and how quickly can you put your budget back into surplus and how quickly can you then pay down the debt? So that's a debate. Yeah? And sometimes the cost, the political cost and the practical cost of really quick consolidation is too high. And that's a political decision. So economists will tell in, inside government, some of you may be in this position, will tell government they should consolidate as fast as they can. People who are interested in uh, human beings and welfare will probably try and moderate that view on the grounds that you want this to be done in a way that causes the least pain. And there's a, there's a calculus there, which guess what? The politicians get to make. 
So Marx talked already about the importance of trust, evidence, and innovation, and I agree with what he said. Let me just underscore the point about trust, because it, when it comes to creating fiscal space and creating budgetary initiatives, trust is fundamental. And if you read the, the Edelman, Edelman Trust Index, which has been running over a number of years, what it will show you is that trust has been declining in basically all of the countries we would consider ourselves to be comparable with and in many other con countries as well. Now, actually, the good news is, even though the public can't always distinguish between who is a public servant and who is a politician, you'll be pleased to know in this country, public servants hit, I think, about the giddy height of 38% being trusted, as opposed to politicians who are somewhere sub 20%. On the upside, used car salesmen are still at the bottom of the pile, which gives me faith in the universe. So you will trust when people start talking to you about things that need doing. You will trust someone who is closest to you. Interestingly, nurses now ping um, doctors in terms of trust. You will trust when it comes to the corporations, a staff member of that corporation. So you know the advertising you see when it's got, you know, Josephine um, uh, car hirer or insurance writer or whatever, that's because we as people these days will trust someone who works for a corporation, not an expert. So we don't trust experts anymore. So actually, an economist standing up and going on ad nauseum about how we're all about to be ruined hand to hand is the worst thing you could possibly do. People who actually work in contexts, who talk about the importance of things, are much more believable. And people actually, paradoxically, want strong leaders. They want people who will innovate. They want people who will change. I know that sounds paradoxical, but for people who don't trust, and particularly people who are tending to fear, they actually want people to take decisions and do things. And I think the things that Mark talked about in terms of the view of politics actually reflect that very much. So Jeff Gallup said recently, what people these do, days do is personalise, catastrophise, and generalise. Easy to remember, and it's absolutely true. So let's think about that as a context when you're trying to create fiscal space. And I said I was going to talk about evidence-based policy, and so this is where I just want to talk for a second. Never confuse evidence-based policy with evidence-based priorities. Okay? Because in my experience, there's always evidence about a particular policy initiative. And in fact, these days, you're hard pressed to get something in the room, if I can use that language, in other words, into ERC and for our guests, the expenditure review committee who decides what will get spent in our government. I've almost never seen an NPP, new policy proposal, that has no evidence in it. Numbers, statistics, compelling arguments, beautifully written. Sometimes a little dense. But let's be clear, the politicians never read them. Sorry to burst your bubble. So evidence is there in those policy proposals. It's the priorities that are the issue. So I talked to a group of people recently about policy development. And I said to them, how many of you have got a good idea for a new policy? Let me ask you, how many of you have got a good idea for a new policy proposal? Oh, come on. I bet you all have. There's some idea in where you work or what you've been thinking about. You know, I could spend this on Aboriginal health and it'd improve life expectancy you know, off the scale. Whatever is your passion, you could think of something that's a great idea. I will put money on it. In fact, you could probably think of at least 10 things if I gave you half an hour to write them down. We are not short of good ideas. But when it comes to the new policy pro process, the question is, so we ask our session, is it a good idea? Sure, it's a good idea. Then ask yourself the next question, says who? Says who? Is it going to be a priority? So the question of how people set priorities is fundamental to the budget process. So go back to what I just said about the fiscal context. Is your priority about getting back to surplus over what period? 
What does that then mean if you look at expenditure? And remembering that there are some drivers in government which basically just generate expenditure and sometimes growing at a faster rate than GDP and revenue. So if your expenditure in a particular program is growing faster than revenue, it's consuming more as a proportion of the Commonwealth budget than it was last year. So I used to be responsible for the pin-up program for people who are fiscally prudent to hate, and that was the pharmaceutical benefits scheme, which grew when I, was first, when I first arrived in finance in ways that I cannot describe to you. People hated the PBS who were worried about expenditure and they kept coming up with good ideas to save money. The only trouble is that they kept coming up with good ideas to save money out of the PBS after we got growth under control. And so we had to then go back to the priorities question. Is your priority to continue to cut Australians' access to medicines and to continue Australians' access to cutting-edge, world-leading medicines, that might be your priority? Or is your priority to continue to be able to give people access, providing you've got the money under control? Can you see the difference? It's a really important difference. Now, as it happened, eventually we convinced people that growth rates running at about GDP growth rates was probably not unreasonable. And as I kept pointing out, and with apologies to any New Zealanders in the room, we don't want to be New Zealand. Why? Because Pharmac in New Zealand, basically, if you're lucky, you're going to get second um, generation, so old therapy. For those women in the room and for the guys who've ever paid any attention, Herceptin, um, a crucial drug in helping women with breast cancer, uh, we got access to Herceptin in the late 1990s in this country. In New Zealand, they got it towards the, basically 10 years later. 10 years, so think of the women whose lives that impacted. So how you set priorities is crucial. Evidence-based policy, tick, it's all absolutely appropriate. Now, can I just give you one little piece of advice, though? You can have all the evidence in the world on something that someone has decided as a priority, and at the risk of ruining the people who think everything here is completely rational, let me just explain to you you tick all the boxes, you've offset everything, uh, it's all a beautiful thing, there's more evidence, you've got a positive coordination comment out of the Department of Finance, the green brief says, yeah, it's great, but an anecdote will kill you. So we always need to understand that if you have a good anecdote in favour of your new policy, it's going to help you as well. So Mark talked about trust, I've covered, evidence I've covered, he also talked about innovation. And innovation in the fiscal space is something we also need to think about in the budget context. Because our traditional approach on innovation was that lovely, and politicians love to use this language, don't they, tax and spend. We raise revenue from taxation, and then we spent it. And as I used to say in finance, uh, I understand how to spend off scratch, because I do that really, really well. The challenge is always, do I need to spend this and does tax have to stay wherever it is in order for me to spend this? Now the answer in some cases is no. So Australia has actually innovated in the financing world. We now take it for granted and it's been adopted around the world, not universally popular I acknowledge. HEX, the Higher Education Contribution Scheme. And again, we can have a conversation about how much people should pay as a contribution to their degrees or their tertiary, you know, their, their uh, workplace qualifications. But what we decided was, as a country, that we ought to basically share the cost, and indeed we could do that in a way that didn't require people to actually upfront spend the money to actually get that qualification. Many of you will be paying off, probably at a really slow rate, uh, a hex debt. Some of you may have had a parent who took pity on you and paid it off for you, probably with a condition attached. That's happened in my household. So you need to think about what the alternative mechanisms for financing are, because not everything uh, needs to be tax and spend as a, mo a, a, a model. People also think about revenue in terms of cost recovery. Many people 
run regulatory agencies. Where, let's be honest, the benefit of streamlined regulation, uh, speedy regulation, is felt in our economy. It's felt by workers in our economy. And so the advantage to business of actually getting regulatory decisions taken quickly is huge. And a bit like co-design, uh, people said, well, I suppose we could co-fund. And so that's what they've done. And there's also leverage. Does the government always need to be the one who funds everything 100%? And I know that the relationship we have with the states and territories is um, probably best described as variable. Some days it's good, some days it's bad, most days it's indifferent. Are there people in the NGO sector? Are there people in the academic world? Are there high net worth individuals who will co-fund that very good idea that someone has decided is a priority? Do we need to own? Can we lease? What public-private partnership can we think of? How can we defray risk by doing this? So big capital spends of the old world, the public service I joined, basically we taxed and we spent. We raised almost no revenue. Uh, we built capital assets and we owned them. We leveraged almost nothing. The world of today looks extremely different. So when it comes to creating the fiscal space, to actually financing things, there are options. But fundamentally, if you've exhausted all of those options, then you come down to how are we going to pay for this? Now, the rules and the way we run our budget process, and it is about that discipline I talked about at the very beginning, basically say, unless you have a letter from God or whichever deity you aspire to be close to, you may not bring a new policy proposal forward unless it is fully offset. To our guests, that means you've got a saving that equals the amount of money, and preferably, if you've been given a target, more savings. So sometimes the budget process says, we will take this amount, you have to come with a net save of $2 billion over the forward estimates. Sure, you can spend some money if we like what you bring forward, and we've agreed these might be priorities, but basically, if you don't come in with your $2 billion, all bets are off. So you have to find ways to do that. And this, again, is where we come to priorities. And one of the struggles we have is sometimes uh, these days, and it's in the trust context, everyone values something that you're doing. And so to take something away is very, very, very hard. So the rationale around how you create those savings has to be unbelievably robust. So we talked about evidence. So your savings process had better be evidence-based as well. And boy, had it better think about how you're going to create enough buy-in for people to say, oh, I suppose. It's rare you'll get people to cheer a saving proposal. But if you get people to say, oh, I suppose, because the trade-off is worth it, they understand the trade-off, then you will get somewhere. So basically, creating the fiscal space requires an absolute discipline around process an understanding of priorities, a thinking about evidence, a really serious interrogation of the innovative options that you might have. It requires the kind of political savvy that Mark talked about. It requires an understanding of the audience. It requires a, a buying in of a much broader range of stakeholders than you might otherwise have considered. And then just remember, the anecdote might still kill you. Thank you. Um, uh, can everyone hear me? OK. Yes, I'm Marion Sims. I'm formerly a SES officer in the Australian Research Council and currently I've got a lovely home at ICPA, uh, the institute that Mark runs. And I just had, a, I guess, a, a comment and a question that relates to both presentations which were fabulous and it uh, comes out of Mark's nine ingredients of effective policy design for the 21st century chart which we've all got in front of us and uh, I guess a couple of comments there um, would be one would be that some of that occurs with a new policy process so if a new policy is coming from an agency it needs to um, tick a lot of the boxes in a substantive evidence-based way. And so really a challenge is 
um, maintaining that in, where, in areas where it's not a new policy proposal. So I guess the comment would be, or the question would be, um, if you could just do another table uh, without breaching the Official Secrets Act that really talked about the levers, because there are levers through uh, Expenditure Review Committee, which um, is, is terrifying to have had the prospect, and um, through, other, uh, through other measures as well, such as risk assessment policy. So I'm just, I'm just sort of thinking of it um, not just from a public service perspective, but also in terms of, I guess, central agencies and what they're trying to achieve, how they, how they use the levers. And, um, and just a, a subsidiary comment relates to evidence base and the idea of policy borrowing, because I thought it was interesting that Jane referred to, uh, Professor Holton referred to the policy area where New Zealand wasn't effective, mm. but, on, in, but in many other ways, um, particularly state governments mm. and mm. New Zealand mm. really do, a lot, through COIG as well, mm. do a lot of really interesting work around policy borrowing. Yeah. Um, so I think, you know, that whether you need another column, Mark, but I, I thought that... Um, I don't know what other people thought, but the nine ingredients is, is really comprehensive. That's the only gap I could find. But then maybe a top-down, bottom-up perspective as well. But, but thanks. So can, perhaps I can make a comment, if you wouldn't mind. You talked about basically the kinds of things inter alia that get people's attention. Um, so we, we know that governments, they have election commitments and they have things that they've said they'll do and then there's the things they need to do. Now... Sometimes we come across areas that we think are either incredibly compelling because they're just such a good idea, or they're huge areas of risk and vulnerability and things that really need to happen. And certainly when I was the Secretary of Health, you know, we would see things in the, the, the health security area that were, were really risky for government not to do something about. And so one of the challenges um, is to be a sufficiently good advocate without looking uh, like you're deaf or in, insensitive to the context in which you work, to actually get people on board with those areas that need attention. Um, a good process will actually ensure that a minister has a thorough go through all of those issues before the great and the good in the centre actually cement their view about what is important. So you know, one of my jobs when I was a line department secretary was to make sure, firstly, any new minister I got understood what the process looked like and understood that once the ship had well sailed, it was really hard to get on board. So sometimes being really early with advocacy inside government, together with advocacy across the bureaucracy, was incredibly important. And the risk that you talk about, the risk assessment, I said when I left the public service that I think we still don't do risk very well. And I think that's true. And certainly the thing I now see um, when I go to some of the commercial boards I sit on, where I look at the risk process that they go through, they are unbelievably sophisticated and really um, thoughtfully run. Now, we, we are not that good at risk inside the public sector, but actually a well-run risk process which enables you to have things come forward in a timely time before the ship has sailed in the budget process, for example, that is fundamental to getting people to agree it's a priority. I agree. I think that's in the science and research area. You'd expect it to be better, and it is, but, I, but the challenges in other areas Correct. of line agencies yes. are more complicated. Absolutely. Look, I, I totally agree with... Uh, with what you're suggesting that. Um, but the, to be frank, it was about how do I squeeze so many words in different boxes? It was very <laughs> pragmatic. Yeah, so, so basically when I, when, I, when I was looking at, you know, so for me, if you're designing a performance framework, right, essentially what you're doing is your, um, what you should be doing, um, is you should be um, looking at the key implementation um, issues underpinning the uh, the outcomes framework for the particular initiative that you're looking for, right? Um, so actually designing a performance framework involves impact assessment, it involves all of the sorts of things that you're talking about, it involves risk assessment as well. 
Um, so that I thought performance framework, performance accountability was a way of capturing all of that. Um, but I'd hate to think anybody here, um, so you separate policy and implementation at your peril, right? We've had 50 years of research that's told us that and people still Absolutely. ignore it. it. Um, so I completely agree with what you're saying, yeah. To, to quote, to quote um, a woman I worked for when I was very much younger, she said with a kind of arch look, she said, Jane, your policy is what you actually do, not what you've written on a piece of paper, which I thought said it all. Uh, my question is, uh, the fact is, uh, you talk about the priority, and the fact is in the, in the fiscal, there is some uh, kind of routine expenditure, and it takes yep. a lot of space. Yep. The question is how to break this routine and what is the consequences that you need to yep. face. Very good point. Yeah. So that, that's the holy grail, of course, because if you look at what is sometimes loosely described as discretionary expenditure, and you could question whether things that are technically labelled discretionary are really easily treated as discretionary. Um, it, but it's the big drivers of expenditures that actually determine the state of your budget. So we all know what they are. Health, social welfare, defence. Um, th those are the things that actually comprise, and of course the money we give to the states, that comprises the large share of um, Commonwealth government expenditure. Now, if you're trying to create fiscal space and people don't always understand this, Sometimes it can be hard to cut elements out of those components. They're politically contested. Uh, you will end up with all manner of argument about the micro details of those things. Sometimes what people do is they say, well, you know what, we can actually change the growth trajectory on those elements because that will actually help us bring over time uh, us back into a better fiscal position. And that's a perfectly legitimate strategy. How do you lag growth in some of those programs? Now, the easy way, I use that word with little, you know, little doohickeys around it, um, change indexation. So there's the kind of ways that you can change the, the trajectory of expenditure. They're not easy, let's be clear. Any of them, none of them are easy. But sometimes what you're looking to do is to manage the growth and expenditure in those programs as one of the tools as opposed to cutting components out. Now, I mean, I've been party to I don't know how many processes over the years. What can we abolish? What can we abolish, they say? There must be things we can abolish. And sadly, you bring forward a whole bunch of stuff. Not Who knows what a Washington monument is? Everyone knows what a Washington Monument is? For our guests, in budgetary terms in this country, if you say something as a Washington Monument, as a saving, you've put up something that no one could possibly demolish. So you've brought it forward with the full expectation it will never, ever happen. One of my proudest moments as a line secretary is a moment when Peter Costello said to me, Jane, is that a Washington Monument? I said, no, Treasurer. It was, of course, a Washington Monument. But I was in the room, which is what I needed. So you can look at cutting things, abolishing things, lagging the expenditure on things. None of them are easy. And at different times, some of them may be easier than others. I mean, it's interesting uh, looking at the post-GFC -GF experience in Europe, yeah. um, where because of the criticality of the, the situation, uh, people were more c courageous around cutting wholes wholesale yeah, agencies. They did. Uh, particularly, so a lot of people were arguing for a long period of time that there'd been this exponential growth of integrity agencies and that actually they should be integrating them because they're actually doing a lot of similar work and there's lots of duplication in reporting processes. So, so uh, a number of countries actually did that. Mm. They said, well, we don't need all these, we need just one super integrity agency and they, they integrate it and made actually very significant savings that way. But of course, the problem is, is um, your evaluation framework for doing that. And, and you know, in my view, the Commission of Audit really never developed a proper evaluation framework that everybody okay. was really happy with in terms of determining what should go and what should stay. Yeah. And actually, the one other area I should have mentioned, which in fact you remind me of, so after the, the, around the time of the GFC, um, 
a couple of the Nordic countries actually cut the price they would pay for things. So particularly in the health space, which is obviously something I'm very familiar with, but they just cut reimbursement prices. And you see that happening in the US even in Medicare mm. and Medicaid and some of those programs. They simply say, and we have done that actually in Australia. Again, look, I mean, I'm sorry to keep using health examples. that They just come to the tip of my tongue more easily than others. But for example, when we know um, that the technology has changed in particular areas uh, and we've been paying a reimbursement or a, a contribution for something based on what was a reasonable amount given old technology, well, you'd be mad if you kept giving somebody that amount of money to do something where it's no longer taking that. Pathology would be a good example. Some of you would know people used to actually just take each individual slide and look at it down a microscope. So the point where you took it from an individual slide to an extremely large machine that was whirring thousands of samples around and spitting out the answer, why would you pay the same price? So the two sorts of cutting. There's been a lot of talk um, recently about um, the importance of long-term vision and having a strategic policy capability within departments, and yet I didn't see that as a driving force for any of the NPPs in your slide, Mark. Mm. And I was just wondering if perhaps you could talk about, you know, what role you do see, um, particularly Jane, for the strategic policy sort of areas and departments and, and what impact they do have. Mm. To be fair, I've got a box called Think Long Term, <laughs> um, because I actually think that's absolutely imperative. Um, I should also say as well, is that experience across departments is very different depending on the nature of the function of the department. Yeah. So, you know, um, so my exposition on, on, on evidence, um, if, I, if, if I do that exposition to the Department of Education, for example, they squeal. They say, well, we spend all our time building large-scale time series um, data on, on these issues. Of course, we're thinking long-term. Of course, we're thinking about evidence, right? Um, but if you, if you talk to people in, in PM&C or if you talk to people in, in agencies that I think are more adjacent to the, to the core political agenda, perhaps, yeah. then the story's different. It's much more about retrofitting. There's, there's different policy experiences taking place. Uh, but the focus on the long term is obviously absolutely fundamental, particularly where we have three-year electoral cycles and the public service plays a fundamental stewardship role um, across, across governments. Mm. So th there's also a question of um, basically what is that long-term research and whose priority is it? We come back to that. So Aboriginal health. So if you think about it, Sometimes the people, the continuity of people, will actually help draw the thread of continuity through uh, the priorities, the agendas, and therefore the data that gets driven. Sometimes institutions will do that. I think there'd be very few people who would say we don't need that kind of long-term vision and that long-term thinking. The challenge is um, doing, creating the, the departmental space to enable it to happen. Now, having been um, very, and still am, very connected to the research agenda in a number of places, uh, I'm a huge fan of that. But I think the way you do it has to be relevant to the context. So in some departments, it is uh, about how they set up their research bureaus, so the Bureau of Transport Safety, you know, the Bureau of Agricultural Economics. You know, they have a particular um, style and approach to that. Other departments don't do it the same way. I do think you could argue that we don't spend as much on it as we used to and that we are the worst for it. But sometimes the reason we don't spend as much is because people haven't figured out how to get everyone signed on to the priorities that that research is going to reflect. So I think it's a dialogue we need to have. I don't think we've been very good at having that dialogue with government and I think it's been too easy for fiscal fiends to come along and go, least important function, saving needed, gone. And actually this is where New Zealand have, have been better than us. They have. Uh, because they've been good at identifying you know, long-term outcomes across a, a range of well-being um, indicators um, and developing long, longer-term funding compacts to support yeah. them which has provided stability of funding, particularly for the community sector, which has been very, very important. David Williams, uh, University of Canberra. With the uh, DTA's push for cross-government platforms 
and investment and, uh, and systems. It seems apparent now that the benefits that are going to be accrued from those are going to be um, harvested by a whole range of government agencies and also into the states. Um, do you think that the government systems are now mature enough to look at how they would actually harvest those uh, savings right across uh, government rather than just uh, picking on the, um, the single agency that would be sponsoring it? So, you know, there, there's the um, deeply analysed to the last dollar savings proposal about how much money you will save from something, which then distributes those savings across agencies. And then there's what we might describe as the finger in the wind, sort of slightly random act of violence approach. So you kind of know across an enterprise of 167,000 people that if you do something that basically removes you know, a, a set of human beings and functions from people writing things down that it's gonna save you an amount. Um, and you say, well, I'll just attribute based per capita or whatever it might be, the saving that I know you'll get. And because you know why? that will actually create an incentive for you to get on and do it. And we see that happen. I mean, that's happened in savings proposals. I, I've seen departments bring that forward and say that they'll take savings out of every other department <laughs> in order to finance their particular proposition. So one of the things for the DTA is to actually decide um, what is the best way to do that in order to actually figure out how not to really disenfranchise every other person in the town and actually get the kind of change you want and need. So Mark talked about co-design. I'm a huge fan of co-design. And in fact, I'm a fan of basically getting everyone in the room to say, you know what? We reckon if we basically roll out this universal platform for X, we can collectively save Y and we've got to figure out how we're going to finance that and everyone should play their part. Now, in a world that is much more networked, and we haven't talked at all about network governance and how the world is changing, but in, in the world where actually people are not um, standing on their own little castle and just firing bullets at each other, you should be able to do that as the basis of a policy approach. And I think one of the things that the public service has become, and this is because it's enabled to, shall I say, has become more mature at recently is to say, look, we've had the process where we'll just devolve everything to everybody. We now get that scale gives us an advantage and we can save money from stuff that is fundamentally commoditized if we do it together. Now, when I was a secretary of finance, I used to say to the colleagues, colleague secretaries, guys, we can either do this together or there'll be some ugly random act of violence that I won't be able to stop. Which would you prefer? What a surprise, they wanted to co-design it. What a surprise. So I think it is going forward quite possible for um, the DTA to look at the technology that's needed by public sector, think about how it enables that capability, and then think about the process that enables the people who will be affected by it to help co-design it, which means it will actually be implemented more effectively. Alternatively, they could just promulgate something, get government to sign on, and then have sullen resistance and slow take up um, over a period. I know which way I'd rather do it. So we live, we live in hope. I think they'd be lucky as well that, um, you know, we've been through this creation of the six shared services hub and the pain, pain behind that. It was apparently it was a very, very painful experience. Ooh. Um, but there again, a lot of people are now seeing the, the advantages of actually having gone through that pain. Um, so there are some positive as well as negative <laughs> lessons to be drawn from that process. So actually, it seems to me that there is more appetite now as, as a consequence. But, but, th but think, about, um, think about government travel. So essentially, what we did over a period was consolidated into one contract. The amount of saving that every government department got from that was enormous. And yes, you know, we can all complain about um, whomever is the current provider and whether their call centre staff are hopeless. But as I used to say to people, um, given the generation in here, most of you would be on some sort of Apple device, I'm guessing. Doesn't matter though if you're on Samsung. Every time they issue a new piece of software, 
you look and see what they've changed, don't you, when you've done update, and you think, damn, they've changed the diary function again. Do you write to Apple and complain that it doesn't meet your particular needs? Any of you? No, I bet you don't. In the end, you just suck it up and get on with it. Why? Because you're buying a commodity. So I think one of the challenges for actually the public sector is, is to get more mature about that and say, you know what, there's a bunch of stuff that underpins what we do which is actually commoditized. We're just going to buy the commodity and we're not different and special. And then there's some stuff that really matters in terms of how we do the really detailed bits of the specialised parts of our work and that is different and special and that's where we should invest. Okay. So we'll see how the DTA goes. Okay, so look, I think we've come to the end of our, our time together. And I notice actually that my... Uh, Nepalese delegation have, have gone oh, to wow. dinner and as I'm hosting the dinner I, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, I better wrap up now um, but thank you so much to Jane for, for her contribution it, it was great having her insights on, on these issues thank you Jane <laughs> um, and you'll notice that we we have another smart governance conversation coming up um, in a few more weeks which is around uh, the national survey that we've done on what um, Australians think about the services they receive um, and where they have appetite for innovation. Um, I should also say in closing as well um, that this is my views, right, on new policy proposals. It does not represent the views of the Department of Finance, okay? I really need to emphasize that. Um, it's Mark Evans's perspective, not the Department of Finance's perspective. So thank you. <laughs>